Hello, welcome to the Friday, March 31st, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Quite often, useful features that are being added to software are being used against you by the bad guys. Latest example that Xavier shows here is the encoded command feature in PowerShell, which allows you to execute, for example, base64 encoded strings. This is, of course, useful because it allows you to transport these strings safely through different channels. But then again, it can also be used by bad guys to obfuscate their code. And simple strings that are often being used to detect malware like system net web client or download file and the like are then really just converted into sort of randomish looking characters. Now, some anti-malware of course will decode it, but yet more work that you ask your anti-malware to do. So it may be worthwhile as Xavier suggests to just look for the encoded command string. Well, and this may actually work quite well if it wouldn't be for another Another useful feature in PowerShell that allows you to abbreviate commands for this particular encoded command argument. There are, as one commenter pointed out, about 15 different versions uh, to write it. It can be as simple as just the letter E or EC or EN, and then essentially just any number of letters from the encoded command string. And Palo Alto has documented a pretty interesting semi-targeted malware campaign. In this particular case, I call it semi-targeted because it wasn't really targeted as a, at a specific organization, but instead at a fairly large group of developers with GitHub repositories. If you have a GitHub repository, you may have received an email essentially telling you that it comes from a recruiter and that the recruiter is impressed by what you posted on GitHub. And then of course they're offering you a job and to learn more, you have to open the attachment. And amazingly, it's going downhill from there. The attachment includes a Word document with a macro that will then download additional malware. The first sample being downloaded is uh, Dimni, which uh, is essentially just an other downloader that then established a command control connection. Now, in the end, developers ended up with essentially spyware on their system that included keystroke loggers and the ability to take screenshots. Not really clear if they're sort of after code that these people developed or what the reason was for this particular attack. And while the initial request to download, the initial downloader goes to a random, apparently compromised WordPress site, the interesting part here is that a lot of the command control channel, uh, the encrypted screenshots that are being exfiltrated or the keystroke logs are being sent to domains associated with Google, which of course uh, makes it again more difficult to detect them in your logs. For part of the request, they actually also sort of use a redirect feature in Google, uh, the Google PageRank service, which used to actually act as a proxy, but in this case, it's really more used sort of as a redirect in order to disguise the actual nature of the request. And sometimes when people are talking about attacking air gap systems, things get a little bit silly. The latest paper that I think is really not all that terribly practical, but somewhat interesting is the use of a scanner as an input device. Of course, this particular attack first requires that you already have a malicious software on the device the scanner is connected to, and then you're using a laser to shine a light onto the scanner in order to exchange information with the system. And of course, in order for this paper to be picked up by major news organizations, it needs to mention a drone. And yes, a drone can of course be used to hold the laser and then shine it at the scanner. 
One issue I think the paper actually overlooks, which would be a little bit more interesting in some ways, is that a lot of modern systems actually include light sensors in order to adjust the screen brightness. Scanners are probably a lot less common than these light sensors. And while the sensor reading isn't always detectable directly from the operating system, often the power output and the power draw of the monitor is detectable and could be used in order to deduct the status of this sensor. Well, and that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.